So let's just one thing about this is that um, you have to ask what the trade-offs are. So let's say that you um, are a girl, all, all things considered, an intersex girl, and you have um, uh, an enlarged clitoris. So it's something that looks a little phallic, looks a little bit like a penis. Now, somebody can say, well, we're just going to cut off that tissue and so that you have a more feminine looking petite clitoris because we think that that will be less surprising to your future sexual partners. Now, the girl might think to herself, you know, I actually would like to, to fit into these social norms, but I'm not sure that I accept that risk. Like, you know, you're taking a, you're performing a surgery on the most sensitive tissue on my body. And maybe I don't think that's worth acceptance from people who have a particularly narrow minded view about what a, an acceptable sexual partner is. And so you, even if you even if you agree with that as a goal, normalizing the person's body, the person might not think it's worth the trade off. The other thing too is that uh, you, you might think that what you should do is rather than conforming children to restrictive social norms, you should contest the social norms. You should say, well, wouldn't, maybe people are just unfamiliar with people who have a different ranges and sizes and things of genitalia. And if people are more familiar with different body types, then it, they won't be so startled. And also, you know, so so what you do is you reinforce the social norm every time you modify the ch child's body to conform to it. And so you're complicit in perpetuating the social norm. Whereas if you instead say, hey, let's just educate people and raise consciousness and, you know, let people see that intersex bodies can be beautiful. Um, then it seems to me like over the long haul, you're going to benefit children because you're, you're going to avoid the issue of surgery. And then also, if, if the child grows up and they really don't like their genitals the way they are, they can choose a surgery for themselves at that age. And they can decide once they've gone through counseling and they've done all the other things and they say, you know what, I totally hear you, but nevertheless, I still want you to cut off this clitoral tissue, then maybe that's a choice they can make when they're Gillick competent, which means you know they're a minor who's um, possessive enough information to make an informed decision. The idea is that the decision doesn't have to happen. It's not an emergency. Like a two-year-old isn't having sexual encounters with other people. So you don't need to do the surgery right now. And if they really feel later on that it will help them, just in the same way that somebody might want breast implants. It's like, well, there's troubling cultural reasons why a person might feel that that's a necessary thing to do to be able to appease their sexual partners. But ultimately that's their decision, I suppose, if you're an adult, but you wouldn't yeah. perform breast implants on a five-year-old. I mean, it's not relevant right. at that point and you don't know right. that she would want it. Yeah. And so uh, I, th I, th I think it just, it, it's, uh, it's not an emergency, even though you kind of say, well, they might be yeah. teased 10 years from now. It's like, well, when, then wait 10 years from now and see if they are teased. And if they are, then you can consider your options at that point. So the social isn't just the mainstream culture. There's, you know, yeah. queer and trans friendly spaces that are very accepting yeah. of bodies that have different features. And maybe you'll find that you're more comfortable in a subculture rather than the dominant culture. The thing is that there's no evidence of intersex people who didn't have their genitals altered and say, I'm really upset that that happened. And in fact, I'm experiencing social difficulties. This is a tactic that's raised to talk about potential future fears that we should be concerned with. We have an abundant literature of intersex people saying, I'm really upset that my genitals were operated on when I was a kid and I have scar tissue. I'm sexually impaired because of the multiple surgeries that I had to go through. And you know what? I just wish that this didn't happen to me. So when we're talking about what do we actually have evidence of the lived experience of intersex people, the evidence we have is that intersex people are really upset about having their genitals operated on when they were children and they would prefer to have had some choice in the matter. This group of intersex people who's like, struggling with being socially ostracized, where is the evidence of that? There's, that's, the, that's the speculation. And so I'd rather go with the concrete yeah. testimony we have from existing intersex people who are resentful about what happened. And then if you have somebody who is struggling with the social context, the thing is they have an option available to them. The option is they can get a surgery at that point. Mm -hmm. Whereas the person who already had the surgery done has no comparable recourse if they feel resentful. So there's a major asymmetry in these cases. The person who yeah. had a tissue removed can't get it back. The person who didn't have tissue removed and then is like kind of wishes that they had, well, it's true they can't go back in time and have it done when they were a kid, so they don't have an ideal option, but they have an option available to them. And so I think that asymmetry is also very important. Um, I know lots of intersex people who have fabulous lives. And so there's no, again, there's no evidence that the person's life would be so difficult.